Welcome to Korea and the World, a podcast on political, economic, and social issues from the perspective of the Korean Peninsula. To everyone living in Korea, Kakao Talk is a household name. Yet the popular messaging app is only the poster child of a much larger startup ecosystem. Forbes magazine hailed Korea as the next global hub for tech startups, and the government pledged to spend several billion dollars to foster a creative economy. To learn more about entrepreneurship in Korea and understand the macro trends at work behind the scenes, we had the pleasure to talk to Richard Min. Richard founded two of Korea's first major startup accelerators, Seoul Space and K Startup, attracting investment from global brands such as 500 Startups, Samsung, and Google's entrepreneurship program. He is currently a venture partner at Naxuri Capital and the managing director of Fashion Technology Accelerator here in Seoul. Richard is also the founder of the Plus 822 Convergence Conference and City Fest, which will take place in Seoul this October. He hosts his own weekly show on TBS Primetime Radio and was featured in several news outlets, including Inc. Magazine and Bloomberg. Richard Min, welcome to Korea and the World. Thank you. Can you tell us a bit about your background and how you caught this whole entrepreneurship virus? Ah, the virus. Well, the virus, I think, has kind of been in me from the beginning. I've uh, been in the, I guess, this industry, international and IT side, based in Korea for the last 15 years. Uh, self, I've been everywhere from digital marketing side to running agencies, and I caught the, quote, startup side of the entrepreneurship virus bug, uh, I guess, about five years ago when I started the uh, first co-work space and accelerator in Korea. And at that time, the word startup didn't even really exist uh, so it was right at the heart of when the big shift over happened and you've seen this big explosion now with what's going on in, in Korea. So it's been a long, a long kind of deeply involved since the beginning. I've helped launch a lot of the big uh, Silicon Valley companies in Korea and help with the, work with them like Google and Facebook, Twitter, Uber, Evernote, Tapjoy. But I've been fortunate enough to work with a lot of them in doing so and that has allowed me to have a great outside in perspective and, and work deeply and jump in full time which is what I do now in making a new platform to uh, help launch Korean and Asia, Asian I guess, rising stars to the world with uh, the new new project I'm on which is a, a giant kind of conference and festival based in Korea called uh, Plus A22. So you're Korean American? Correct, yes. Why did you move from the US to Korea? What are the opportunities <laughs> you saw here that you couldn't tap well, into or, I, or follow in America? Why did I move originally? I mean, part of it was, uh, was personal, you know, family reconnecting with uh, the Korean roots, as it were. Uh, some of it was opportunistic and seeing opportunities in business. I've always been doing entrepreneurship, uh, even from the States uh, to here. And at that time, I saw uh, an opportunity to really bring some of the know-how or what I, what I saw as good business uh, practices to Korea and try to you know, launch some, some new things that could change the environment here. And that was at least uh, 10, uh, about 15 years ago, as I said. But I've also worked in the government side of this too. So as I was going and coming here, I began more, uh, I guess, fell in love again with um, the opportunity, the challenge, the roots, the culture of everything that was Korea at the time up until now. And nothing's changed then. In fact, it seems to be even more of a rocket ship than it was. So I believe I made the right decision mm. at that time. So you uh, founded two major startup accelerators, as you mentioned, right? Actually, K-Space and Seoul Space. Three. Three. Even. <laughs> uh, for our listeners who maybe do not know everything about the startup world, can you maybe explain what kind of startups do they take under their wings and how does it work? Sure. In case they don't even know, Accelerator uh, is... <laughs> It's kind of, um, in base definition, almost a consulting or an incubator, as it were, business incubator that takes small companies or startups, as it were, and gives them a lot of uh, resources, whether it's mentorship, funding, or space, physical space, and other know-hows in order to help take that company from being a small company to a bigger company to a, even a growth company. And the first one I started was really kind of, we didn't know what was going on at all either. It was like, hey... I think there's an opportunity now. Korea is changing. It's starting to open up. And there was a massive shift at that time of things opening up. And uh, some of myself and my colleagues and friends, like some old, very old and early Google guys, that opportunity, you know, being close with, said, you know, what would happen if we just kind of made a space for entrepreneurs and startups, if they're even out there, to come together and then we could help them out and uh, make what is known as an accelerator on doing so. So we kind of just got us some like kind guys and said, let's just do this. At the beginning, it was very open. We didn't have a, a strict agenda or a mandate, this kind of company. We just wanted to see what kind of company would be interesting, who would come out of the woodworks to do it. The second we did that, it kind of exploded uh, underneath us, and we mm. spent more time uh, 
trying to throw infrastructure under the momentum than the reverse uh, of that, which is a great thing. In other words, there were a lot of top talent and a lot of surprising, amazing uh, entrepreneurs that were ready to go and just needed that kind of uh, direction or, I say, uh, initial lines of a pipeline to happen so they can jump on that. So after that, uh, we learned, started learning our lessons, started getting better at it, and we aligned with a government entity or kind of a partial government uh, entity to make it bigger. So the first one was Soul Space, as I just mentioned. Mm -hmm. That's what happened, that kind of first kind of mix of craziness all jumped into one pot and then we aligned with the government to create what was K startup and that became a little bit more directive requiring a certain stage or looking for a certain stage just to keep focus on it and adding different resources that was uh, backed by Google entrepreneurship program which is the first time in Asia they did so to allow that that platform to get even bigger and invite more startups or early stage companies to come in we basically covered internet games mobile and uh, other businesses that uh, at least touch upon or leverage the technology because we see those as very scalable on that side. And then the last accelerator I, I was with was working with a fashion technology accelerator. Mm -hmm. And the reason for that one, well, if it wasn't obvious, focus more on the fashion uh, startup. So it was more tech startups that touched the fashion industry, which sounds more specific, but it was just as huge because I saw it as great, one of the last great industries yet to be disrupted by technology which is in a way another blue ocean to hit. It's in a very old tr multi-trillion dollar industry touching technology and that, that's a great opportunity. You have markets all throughout Asia uh, and you have a very distinct line of startups that weren't tapped into before. So if we can align that value chain, um, we're very happy to do so. And that was also had a, a base in Silicon Valley, Milan, and I, I ran Seoul and uh, kind of Asia through that. So we were able to align resources the world as well. So those startups are very specifically in, in those zones. And then most recently, I take all those accelerators, wrap them up, and again, making this new platform called uh, Plus A22, which I'm really excited about right now. We're going to talk about governmental issues a bit later, but since you, you mentioned that Case Startup was uh, mm -hmm. founded with the help of the government, how was it working with the government at the time? What was their objective? And oh, dear, dear me. <laughs> <laughs> um, so this is, this is where I can ride both sides of the fence and uh, uh, on that side. It is both complete and utter, if I can say, hell to work with the government. That's politically okay. And it's complete and utterly great to work with the government, which I don't also know is okay to say, <laughs> depending on which perspective you're coming from. Uh, let's say many lessons were learned. It's not the first time I've worked with the government in that sense, but it's kind of um, the 500 pound gorilla in the room that no one wants to talk about and believe they're separate from. But Korea is a very small country. And if you try to avoid it completely, then you're just negligent in your duty. You might choose to use it in a way that you don't, not kind of uh, taking funds or subject to the rules as much. But to ignore it completely is just is kind of like saying there's no other, no other person in the room that could help or hurt what you're doing. So we spent a lot of time aligning with them. It was very valuable. It was very necessary. But enjoying the experience, you know, it has to depend what day you're, you're asking me on it. Um, but I used to joke that it's kind of in the day-to-day, -day, it's really, really difficult. You're banging your head up against a wall. Uh, on a month-to-month, -month, you're like, okay, I can see where it's going. But if you look on it maybe even a year-to-year, -year, you're like, wow, look what we did. This is amazing. Depending what view you're on, on it, if you want to take a longer view, it's actually been quite, quite amazing. And what the government doing, I absolutely think is, is probably, if I were to make one bet, the best thing that they could be doing uh, at this time, which also can be seen both ways depending which way you talk. So again, on the day-to-day, -day, uh, guys, a lot to complain about, of course. On a macro scale, been very great. Let's go on it. I always say, you know what the biggest startup right now in Korea is? Uh, I say the biggest startup in Korea is <laughs> Korea. And if you look at Korea on a macro scale and how the nation plays against other nations, if it was a startup and you saw that all nations and all, all countries now are kind of competing on a basis of innovation, or we're the next Silicon Valley of Asia, or we're the next Silicon Valley of wherever, or we're the most innovative country, and all the reports indexes say the same thing. Uh, Korea was number one most innovative company by Bloomberg recently, or we're, we're doing a thing with Vienna, like how do we increase the, the attractiveness of our country to invite more entrepreneurs? On that sense, if you look where Korea was five years ago with the way it is now, it's amazing. I mean, it is a different planet. And in fact, I've seen more change over the last five years in Korea for the better in supporting mm -hmm. entrepreneurship and innovation, assuming that's the thing you want to be competing on, for the better in the last five, than the last 15 years combined. And that is, says something. And if you look at the track and how many things, things have changed, like angel investment law or venture capital law in the last few years, it's, the law has changed like five or six times. I mean, who does that? Who changes law five or six times? It's extremely fast. Yeah, it's in insanely fast. So we talk startup iteration is, uh, you know, fail fast or like iterate fast. It's exactly what the government is doing. But government has different cycles 
which are frustratingly slow when you want to be a Silicon Valley style change every day. And we pivoted, you know, three mm-hmm. times yesterday, as opposed to government where you have to, you know, you have to type pair of money. You got to iterate per, per cycle when it goes on. And that, in that sense, it's doing very well. I don't know if that answers the question, how it is to work with the government, but it certainly made me more aware of the mechanisms that are needed to look at things from the government perspective as opposed to just purely what I want to get out of it to help startups. Did you have to adapt to this to this environment? Because if I'm correct in the Silicon Valley, you know, there is a very prevalent libertarian viewpoint that the government should be as far away as possible. How, how was that, you know, personally? This is interesting. And like, I don't know how many gigabytes of recording you have on that one, but I'm going go on that one because I think Silicon Valley doesn't know what the hell it's doing when it comes to this stuff out here. In fact, it used to be, how do you make Silicon Valley, the Silicon Valley of Asia or Silicon in Korea? And I think that's, that's wrong. It's not how we're Silicon Valley here. It's you learn the lessons from their best practices are great. Complete your building your own thing, whatever it is that is. Learning those best practices. And that's the best way to do it. So if you're saying, do we have to adapt? Absolutely. We have to learn what not to learn or what to be okay with making it ourselves doing in that sense. And uh, when I said they don't know what they're doing is I realized Korea mechanisms as well as usually a lot of smaller countries, is certainly Europe, uh, the benchmark is the thing you have to consider are, are so different that when I'm talking the biggest guys in tech, I was still come by and talk and we're having these little just sit downs, very open talks. I realize they, they have no idea either because they don't deal with these things because here's a, an interesting uh, fact to put in perspective. The U.S. is probably less than 1% of uh, venture capital that is, is government backed or government related. Mm-hmm. Korea, more than 40% of all venture capital is government money. It is insane to think that if you're coming from Silicon Valley. And yet, that's that's the reality of it, and there's no other way around it, or else you wouldn't have an venture capital or angel environment or, or anything related to being able to make it work in such a, a consolidated small country. That's homogenous, let's not forget. I always say the biggest secret in Korea is that everyone's Korean. <laughs> so it's like you come and you forget these mechanisms of getting it right here is getting right for the whole country, right? So the line I like to use because it's so true and to define where we're at with the government, the startup and where the economy is going is, remember, if we're a startup and thinking that way, we're talking a traditionally top-down economy, not just the government, but but the chebels, the conglomerates here, right? Traditionally top-down economy that got here, miracle in the last mm. 30 years, all of a sudden we're Korea, Gangnam style, cool, it's cool to be Korean, but where it was, it was like, you know, rice paddy fields and all that kind of stuff a while ago. How to get from there to here, it was top down. It made it happen. But now we have a top down economy make betting on a bottom up mechanic to be the next dynamic of economic growth into the future, right? And so that that, that top down to the bottom up mechanic, where that, where that hitting together is where we are right now. So of course there's a lot of chaos and trying to figure it out as it goes. That last mile is hopefully things like accelerators, angel funds, or platforms, like AG2 are doing to kind of bridge that last mile from turning that allocation of government money into money that was executed in a way that, that anyone can understand or is useful for the continued growth. That's the actual bet of the creative economy, which I'm sure is going to be a big theme, uh, not just in Korea, but for Asia and all around the world, is, is betting on that mechanic. What do we have to show for it is what we still need to, uh, to work on. We're right in the middle of that, but as long as the success stories are made, people are going to find that there's something worthwhile to back. How did Korea become so hot as a startup hub? Just quoting Forbes, South Korea will be the next global hub for tech startups. Mm -hmm. Uh, Other publications also say it's Asia's new startup hub. Is it just an impression? Is it just, you know, the the heat? I will say, say, and I'll, I'll make this statement, probably Korea is one of the best places on the planet right now to do a startup. If you are a new person getting into the game. Why? If you're a startup, you're trying to probably build something on scale, right? So you have one the best broadband in the world, right? Over 100% broadband penetration. Most of the broadband that we, and mobile we have here, when they develop mobile, you have to downgrade it for other countries, right? It, like I said, it's a homogenous culture too. So if you get it right, you can saturate, more companies go from zero to saturate, market saturation than anywhere else mm-hmm. in a faster time at that. There is a flood of government money, as we've been implying right here. There's bigger per capita spend in, than any other country on the planet for stimulating this economy for it at the same time. So you got a test bed, you got a market, and you have the tweener issue. The tweeners were stuck between China and Japan, right? So what used to be a, a side thought, right? Now Korea as a Korean wave is very culturally influential in the region, right? So you have a region, if you get it right in Korea, you can capture all of the markets in China and Japan, where previously you couldn't do that. However, if you get it wrong, it's still a tweener, it's a small car mm. and you use a nice test ground, and you test it on the most, the best tech hub on the planet to do so. 
trust me, anywhere you go from there is a downgrade, you're going to be all right. If you succeed here, you can see, succeed in the region. If you fail here, it's a great test market. And the other thing is if you hit Asia as a region, which is obviously a massive important market, if you do in China or you do Japan and you come to Korea, you have to start from ground zero in Korea again. You can't just seep in here and expect it to work. There's People say Singapore is a great place to go. Tell me one thing about Singapore that's better to do than coming in here for, for starting a market on there. They say all this money there. It's startups. There's only so much you need on it. Korea spent $14 billion. $14 billion on ICT in the startup market. $4 billion of that going straight to startups. There's a 5 to 1 matching, now soon to be a 9 to 1 matching program for startups right now. You give you 100000 another 900000 comes from the government basically for free. Okay, so it's a million dollar company all of a sudden just for your idea, and they need they have more money than they have ideas right now. So if, I, if I'm sitting in Silicon Valley and I'm thinking the world, stay in America, you do that stuff, that's great. Take your best practice, bring it here, you'll be the top of, of a pile that is potentially the biggest pile on the planet coming up very soon. And right now you'll get more traction, more money for the dollar than anywhere else you're going to get on better networks and systems. And then plus you're sitting right next to those conglomerates, which is like Samsung, uh, LG, and those guys who are a huge target for a lot of these companies to get even distribution, much less deals or, or acquisitions from. So if you give me another country with those specs, you got Israel, you got Chile, you got the U.S., you got other stuff, then we're welcome to actually make a bridge between mm -hmm. them and, and then you, you get best of both worlds. I think for a lot of foreigners, when we speak about Korean startups, what they immediately think about is Kakao Talk. Is it? I think a lot of foreigners have a feeling that there are only a few Korean successes. Uh, they only hear about a few names. Sure. What are the other big names out there that we have never heard of but are actually very important? What are you doing or what are people doing to get it out there that there is more than just one Kakao Talk or one right. neighbor? Or I, it's, a, it's a great question. Yeah. Um, and the first part when I said, when I asked, is it, it's certainly if you do know the tech industry in Korea, Kakao Talk is a great example. Now, it is the messenger app for Korea, for those who don't know still. And I was always surprised because we forget what we don't know because we're here, we're, we're soaking it in. No one in Korea doesn't know Kakao Talk. If you're in Korea and you don't know Kakao Talk, it means you actually weren't here at all or talk to any actually human being while you're here. So it's like the WhatsApp of Korea, the, the, the think of the WeChat uh, and supply of Korea. So literally everyone pretty much has it if you have a, a phone. What I was interested in is when I say that, to assume to even the biggest tech guys in Silicon Valley were fund guys or investors who you would assume know, they're still like, I don't know, what is that? I'm like, oh my gosh, okay. Let me, let me, let me like back that up again. Um, now, when you're saying, what am I doing? What are the other companies? That's also the point of, the, of what, what's going on here is Korea's mission, my mission, both from a business perspective and a personal one, and a, a nation building one uh, or save the save the world one is how do we create more of the success story so everyone from you and your grandmother and the person's grandmother sitting in somewhere in Oklahoma know what it is now there should be others like the president or the UN uh, the secular general and stuff like that but right now I think probably the two greatest uh, brands coming out of Korea not greatest sorry most well known would be those guys up north a little bit uh, up there on that and uh, probably Sai from Gangnam mm -hmm. style to say that we're going to create more success stories, like who is the Facebook of Korea, or you even in the question said neighbor. I actually don't think anyone knows what neighbor is. So everyone generally knows what Google, and it's very shocking to say Google, it's, it's the Google of Korea, but I don't even say that anymore because Google, and I've worked with them from day one to here, coming at 15 years later, has a massive 6% market share. Uh, at now, neighbor is like a 72% or, or back and forth, and they created Lion, which has 400 million users and and Kakao mm. you just mentioned is like two like 150 200 million users and no one really knows what's going on so right now yes you do point to Kakao you might point to Nexon which is a big game company it's a multi-billion dollar company you might if you're really researching see as a startup like Coupang which is now uh, over a billion dollar unicorn company uh, the idea from Silicon Valley on the status is are you a unicorn status company and that's kind of the vernacular term for meaning from a startup, like a couple guys, mm. to over a you know, billion dollar company, whatever it's valuation or whether it's actual revenue or that kind of thing. So we do have those like Kakao, I just mentioned, uh, Nexon uh, originally that, Coupon, maybe uh, you know, Smallgate and a few others who are heading all that, that way. But the fact is there are a bunch of billion dollar companies coming out of Korea. Now they haven't reached brand name status where the, you know, anyone and, and everyone knows them per se, uh, and that's kind of the mission we're on. So what are we doing to do that? I'm building my platform. I mentioned a couple of times. It's, mm -hmm. it's kind of a 
what I would call the, the global convergence platform in Korea for uh, inspiration worldwide. And by doing that, we create a sustainable platform where, yes, if you were from the States, from Europe, from wherever it is, you know the one place to go to to find that famous company out of Korea. Discover the next Apple or... Uh, Actually, we forgot what the biggest brand names here is Samsung. <laughs> yeah. Samsung coming out of here and the conglomerates on that stage. Where do you see the most growth and in innovation? Because we've been talking a lot about apps, but what about cloud? What about software as a service? What about more hardware stuff like biotechnologies that have been uh, quite a serious? Yes, yes, and yes. I mean, obviously, um, <laughs> mobile gets the most apps, get the most play because it's such a, a fertile ground. Uh, we have the fastest you know, mobile download, we have the fastest, uh, the most smartphone penetration, per capita, the, the biggest growth on it. We're the home of you know, some of the biggest smartphone makers. So you just by natural and you end up with that. In fact, uh, I think their app store here is one of the biggest app stores on the planet outside of actual Google Play or uh, Apple uh, iTunes itself. So you, you end up with a lot of things like that, but also people might not realize it's the gaming capital of the world. They uh, have all these PC rooms, like 50,000 in, in Korea alone, and the, the World Series of Gaming is held here. It sounds like it's like, oh, just gaming, but gaming itself is a multi-billion dollar industry. Korean content is a huge, actually content, and where it passes in innovation or digital is, is you know, it's a definitional, semantical issue. But with distribution networks like YouTube or, or uh, you know, mobile networks as in video, that's uh, in general, that content is a huge influencer and an area that people are diving deep into to seeing how they either digitize it, how they get biz different business models it, because it scales. Again, when you talk about hardware, Korea is pushing IoT big time, and you see a lot of IoT Internet of Things mm -hmm. uh, as a major platform I see growing. Now, I don't deal directly in other, other areas. Myself, I don't follow energies like, uh, like energy or healthcare, but those are actually hot spots here. Korea is a, a huge plastic surgery capital as well, so there's a lot of medical tourism, and that's, that's forcing a lot of innovative growth at the same time. But I see the areas pushing is content and its digital formats and how that will be uh, as an area they're looking for scalability. Again, creative economy helps out a lot, uh, that platform. Uh, mobile will continue to be pushed, not necessarily apps, but whatever mobile means. And in terms of hardware, we're looking at IoT uh, and where that touches and uh, wearables might fall in that, that district at the same time. So you mentioned why Korea is now such a desirable lo uh, location to uh, open a business. But I wanted to ask you, isn't actually this whole startup bubble, let's say, a consequence of economic stagnation in the sense that given the situation of the Korean job market, it's almost impossible to get you know one of those old-fashioned, safe, secure, reliable jobs at major corporation. And so for young people nowadays, if you have talent, probably the best way forward is to get into startups, try to open a business, because there's just no... The first answer would be, so what? Hmm? Every economic force is a result of some other economic hmm. force happening. Yay, this one happens to align with entrepreneurship, which is good for me and good for entrepreneurs. If you are a kind of person who bets on innovation and entrepreneurship for the future, yeah, mm -hmm. <laughs> that's good for us. But I actually don't know if it would be a reaction to it. I actually um, probably see different macro scales for being a much more actual positive mechanism of betting and looking at industries that could possibly keep Korea scalable uh, into the future. It's not hardware if it's uh, you got China or textile, you know, that kind of stuff. You can't compete on price. The technical aspect is growing, obviously. But with Japan, obviously a massive market on there, that side, the intellectual properties aren't going to be as easy. So content and betting a creative economy is not a bad bet to push forward on it. Now, what I was positive and you said, you know, they're not getting jobs at, at conglomerates anymore, and so they're going into entrepreneurship. I really wish that were true. Mm. If that was the truth, then uh, my job would have been easier in many regards because the early part of the startup ecosystem, the hardest part was not the money, was not the opportunity. The part was just uh, culture. And there's a huge stigmatism against uh, jumping into entrepreneurship, as in fear of failure. Uh, you know, U.S., it's you, fear, you, you fail. You did a company, you fail. You fail a couple times. It's almost a badge of honor. You learn the experience. Great job. Here, you fail, you fail. It's like, shame on you. There's the old joke, you know, I always say that uh, my target market is the ajamas or the old ladies, the married ladies. Because when they can go in a little uh, uh, group together at their Tupperware parties, but here, kimchi party, whatever it is, yeah, yeah. and brag about their son or daughter who is now going to be the next entrepreneur of the world, you know, that's when I've succeeded. Because right now, it's still, if you're not a doctor, lawyer, or work mm. for Samsung or conglomerate, you're going to get smacked upside the head and go back and get your certificates. Now, that shift has been... Has been it's been shifting. It has been shifting, but that was a huge and direct and very obvious obstacle. If that was the case that they weren't getting jobs over there and they're forced into this, then that means that, that means I missed a few things on, on that, that barometer there, but I, I know a few people who would say that. 
the best and most optimistic or exciting thing I recently heard was a great anecdote that um, I was talking with a professor at one of the major universities and it made me feel good and encouraged is I was like, hey, so do you have a lot of students who are getting into entrepreneurship or studying it now? He's like, oh yeah, they really want to get into it and they're really excited. I'm like, well, that's pretty awesome. He's like, but there's a huge hurdle still. There not enough are that could be or should be. I'm like, well, why is that? And he's like, well, fear. Hmm. I'm like, yeah, of course, you know, fear of failure, fear of the culture, that fear of getting and not have a secure job as the story has been for many years. And he said, no, not that kind of fear. I'm like, well, what do you mean? He's like, no, it's the fear that they know that if they don't do something now and, and take advantage of this, they're going to have to end up at one of the conglomerates where their creativity and their chance for entrepreneurs is going to be completely killed and undermined because once that happens, they're dead. They know where they have to be where the next 20 years or wherever it is and the opportunity to be lost. I was like, really? I'm like, is that just one or two? He's like, no, that's like most of our students. I was like, that is shocking, encouraging. And I'm like, wow, I've, one of the few times I felt like I had in a, a, a true anecdotal way, mm. felt that we had a result in building all these ecosystem players to try to stimulate that. Now, again, we're not trying to wipe out real jobs like, you know, becoming a doctor or a lawyer or other professions, but it's more creating an environment where they know that this is also a viable path, where they where they might not have taken it uh, if they were in a different country, different environment, because it's not accepted or it's not seen as the right way, but to have that open up and know that it is a valid path. How do you explain this cultural shift that you're uh, uh, depicting? Now, okay, so people ask us how do we end up with like broadband and all that kind of stuff and 100, 111% broadband, more than one household. And uh, as much as cultural force and maybe DNA in terms of like Koreans are very gadget oriented and, and you know, are, are good at that stuff, we can go on the anthropological reasons for, uh, for some theoretical reasons, but it's a lot more practical. I see. We ended up with broadband when, when five things came together. One, there was a global trend towards internet being a thing you needed to do. The government got involved and spent a lot of money to do so. They forced the conglomerates to spend a lot of money to do so. So you had big business, government, and global trend happening. And then you had academia who supported that mm. uh, to have it and start being kind of infiltrated into basically student and academia on that side. And then you had local trend too. Korea's very insular at, up till then. It was kind of the, the walled garden, as it were, the, the hermit nation for many reasons, the kind of Galapagos growth that was going on. But even within there, they and Matt's saying, we need internet. Now, how did, what happened? The result was about 100% <laughs> internet broadband. Mm -hmm. We've been doing broadband here for so long, we don't understand the big deal is on other countries. And we're like, what the heck? Why aren't you on broadband? Oh my gosh, I'm really <laughs> frustrated. I even go back to Silicon Valley, I'm like, oh my gosh, this doesn't work on the subway. Is this, is this for real? We forget and take that for advantage. Now, I see that kind of perfect storm of events happening now with the introduction of smartphones, which I think was the, the next true paradigm shift in Korea. Uh, happening because of creating an environment of now also open markets that didn't exist. So add those five elements, the same five elements happening, and then add in open markets because Android and and uh, Apple became the old, ultimate Trojan horses for international mm. companies to come in. Basically, when you had an iPhone or someone coming on here, you couldn't stop them from playing Angry Birds or whatever game it was from or Facebook or friending friending Lady Gaga on Twitter. This is actually the thing that disrupted mo more than anything. And also you had a guy at Samsung or some other developer who normally had a 20 year path, you know, getting their way up that ladder to being able to make an app that can launch globally after, you know, developing it for two weeks and nothing anyone else could do to stop it and end up making more money. And there are examples of those, mm. making more money by hitting top of the app store in one month than they would have worked the last 20 years, you know, working hard at a conglomerate mm. and happening now. I have no idea if I'm still on track for the question. Well, I think you, gave, <laughs> I think you gave us kind of for like a, a the tech explanation of this cultural shift, but isn't also an economic explanation in the sense that now that Korea is a rich country, children can afford to fail, or should I say parents can afford having children, you know, go into entrepreneurship and if it doesn't work out well, it's all right, they, they, they have the financial backbone. Whereas in the past, obviously, you couldn't take that risk. The answer is obviously yes to that. It's a mix of factors like all, mm. all things will always be. But when I mentioned the five factors going it, the government did basically invest a lot. It's a stimulus package with a certain goal. Uh, a certain goal of creating upward mechanics from, from outside of the conglomerate system and supporting those potential future uh, creatives or originals or people who need support from the small, medium business side that wouldn't have normally got it. Because uh, when you're in Korea, if you get dominated, you can't avoid the, the conglomerates in that sense for it. So the culture shift, a lot of it was, and you have to give them credit where credit is due, the government pushing it and saying, decided we're gonna do this. Now remember, government is one of the few also jobs that is acceptable in Korea. So if the government from the president down is saying, it's okay to do this, 
and we're going to give you money to do so. The parents, as it were, the family, uh, uh, extended family system has much less to say about it. The stamp of approval. In some Absolutely. Sorts, yeah. I mean, you have, and now you have academia at the same time, and you do get, they love certificates, and certificates, that means you did something that was official. The more certificates you have, the more official and the more okay it was to do so. But now you're getting something from the government to say you're an entrepreneur, here's a certificate of your entrepreneurship, and you, and you will have more startups, or I would say entrepreneurs, or outside the Chebel system types, individual smart meets, being vaunted in front of media, uh, being taken as poster children, as it were, for the new economy, than ever you've probably ever had in the last, I don't know, however long, doing so. So just by doing that in itself, there absolutely is a cultural effect to it. The fact that and when I was young, uh, if, if I said I was going to be a, try to be a celebrity or a baseball star or something like that, I would get pulled smack upside the head. i um, be like, you got to be crazy. But now, in that self, is also seen as an economic vehicle for growth that is legitimized and is a real career. Those shifts, both culturally, entertainment-wise, you know, obviously Korean popular music is very influential, as well as these startups getting a lot of government backing, credibility, and money flowing mm -hmm. there, and some success stories happening, then uh, you are seeing the triple-down effect. Now, it took five, a few years. And where that continues on really depends on how many success stories happening where if the next government is going to say, why do you spend that money or good job spending mm. that money, where the, how justified they can be in criticizing either way is, is the next task. But as long as we keep these success stories happening enough, it's a bit of a PR game. All, all of the government stuff is a PR game. Then you can see more and more of a cultural shift. Not just on this side of it, but in the government uh, and the, the family side here has been also to reinvest uh, the successes into furthering the, the, the future creators, originals on this, which is something we didn't see happening before that is definitely something for Silicon Valley that I'm trying to, or we are, or the culture needs to mm -hmm. happen for it to be sustainable. I mean, we need more patient capital. And patience, uh, whether it's capital or culture, is the one thing that Korea generally is very bad at <laughs> in, a, in a fast, fast, fast culture for it. So if we can survive that hurdle of it, then I think we're good. I want to ask you about the, the talents behind Korean startups. Mm -hmm. Are they, uh, let's say, local talent or mostly ethnic Koreans? Yes, but who had a, an education abroad. And I'm asking you this because the Korean education system, I think, is seen worldwide as efficient but stifling creativity. Yeah. Um, then again, aren't all education systems have some big proponent of saying it needs a big shift to be changed and made better? So apples or oranges on that mm. one too. I mean, we have a lot of TED Talks even related to that type of thing. The, the question is, who is the talent? Was it coming inbound or outbound? Was it imported or is it grown here? Uh, I'm going to say a lot of the big unicorn companies that are successful now certainly had, I'm not saying whether it's better or worse, but just a statistic basis had generally someone who was very more international or had studied abroad or born abroad, but is ethnically Korean in either the founding members or early side of it. I think more it was because I was early ecosystem um, was we were trying to pick a lot of the, the peaks, cherry picking as it were, and push them forward because we do know, we do need symbols and early successes to keep it you know going forward in that regard, and that generally naturally tended to be companies that were more internationally uh, savvy hmm. uh, towards it, whatever that means. Okay, at the same time, some of the biggest ultimately successes have been pure local. In a sense, is how were they imported it, whether it was extracted or whether it was just actually the local talent and um, expertise was finally be able to uh, unleashed at scale naturally because the systems opened up. That's anyone's guess, and I'm sure there's some good statistics in there that could be done. Uh, but the formula tends to be the same. The best founders uh, for these startups have been very focused, have been very in their DNA of doing it, besides there being an ecosystem around them or not. And we have to thank them for being way out there before anyone else caught on to the whole thing. And then us kind of trying to catch up with them and, and carve out the path to make it as easy, least passive resistant as possible mm -hmm. to continue on their journey to do so. Now, as the generations move down and we're already a few into it, startup game, uh, you're gonna see more pure, pure, pure local. I think startups where, you know, obviously where language is irrelevant of the issue, where culture is irrelevant the issue on, on the scale. Uh, and it's anyone's kind of philosophical paper as to what that actually means mm. uh, for being a local or global uh, in regards and that actually serves a bit of the question too is how government money is spent on this. Is it nation building? Is it for humanity? Is it for the brand? Uh, is it for the entrepreneur? Uh, at the end of the day as long as it makes society better we're generally happy or creates jobs from a government perspective but from a startup or a talent perspective as long as it creates an environment 
to allow those who would be great in, in the definition of whatever it is to flourish with the least amount of obstacles, then, then we've done our job. One last question about uh, the ecosystem as such. Do you see a lot of real innovation in South Korea or is it more jungle of Me Too products and you know they're so good at getting these copycats to the market that they beat Silicon Valley companies to it and that's why we have the feeling that South Korea is extremely innovative? Hmm. Uh, so the first answer is yes, there's, there are tons of true originals here. And the other answer is yes, there are tons of copycats here and they tend to rise the fastest in the sense of being having early successes because Koreans are very good at doing stuff very, very fast and get to market saturation because they know the market because they're in Korea, it's a homogenous culture, they understand what's going on. But then the underlying question that I would ask back to you and the world, and, and we deal with Silicon Valley and other innovation hubs, and I've even been saying the word, is who cares? Mm -hmm. What's the point of actually the question? I'm asking because I think there is a bit of prejudice in the West that if you see a, a new tech company in Asia, well, probably they just copied something. And so, I, you know, I wanted to... You hear that. I mean, yeah. actually some of the most famous copy company on the planet is actually out of Germany. Uh, you know, we have like a, a Rocket Internet, Rocket Internet yeah. or team, <laughs> team Europe who are famous for taking a business model, build it in their local country and then sell it back to the mothership, as it were, for, for the tunes of hundreds and hundreds, if not billions of dollars. So, yes, they're not innovative, but they're laughing all the way to the bank, as it were, and they've created more jobs and more actual performing execution, amazing operational uh, execution guys who are in the job market for startups than any other actual mm. entity that I know of. In Southeast Asia, they were commenting that one of the hugest influencers was Groupon, not because of what Groupon did to, um, uh, Groupon is that uh, social commerce site that was built out of the US, copied and then uh, imported and done in many other countries. But it wasn't because Groupon came there and did that business. It was because it created more actually very talented workforce that put it back into the market than any other entity did in a long time. And those are very, very hireable people who are doing actual other startups that are completely original. Hmm. So you tell me, is that original or not original? Is that good or bad? I don't know. We have the same thing happen here uh, in Korea. A lot was stimulated and a lot was early as copy because it's easy. It doesn't exist here. It exists somewhere else. Someone had that idea. You could frame it in, they were innovative or creative or aggressive or entrepreneur enough to see an idea that didn't exist in their local market and solve a problem that still existed in their market and implement it at speed and at scale, beating out foreign companies that try to do the same thing locally. I find that to be both entrepreneur in spirit and both creative and innovative in execution and idea to actually even see that pattern happening and do it locally. They're not all like that, but there is. At the same time, yes, as that started seeping in and you're looking at companies and you become more mature as an ecosystem, start looking for ideas that originate here, can go to scale in Korea or globally that have nothing, can again, be, the, be imported or exported out as it were, saying, wow, this doesn't exist in the U.S. market or German market. That is coming more and more. And how that ends up in saying, wow, this is so innovative, or what that means to be innovative, uh, again, is another kind of a, another philosophical topic <laughs> <another, laughs> in itself. Yeah. So the short answer is yes, it's more innovative. Uh, yes, it'll be more, you'll see more of those examples in a, in a very obvious way to the general public uh, in whatever country as it goes on. But then I also challenge the idea of what is the point of even asking the question as long as you're pushing society forward, making it better and creating real value for your local as well as regional and then global uh, society or economy. Let's talk a bit about the financing side of things. Very simple question. Who are the main private investors and venture capital firms in South Korea and is the funding ecosystem strong enough to support the actual startup ecosystem. And I'm asking this because at least in traditional finance, the Korean financial sector um, is not considered fully developed by uh, any standards. That's from the startup perspective, right? We're talking about yes. entrepreneurs because, mm. because when you say anything is a simple question in finance, <laughs> <laughs> you've already had kind of an oxymoron in the beginning of it. Uh, I'm going to say, uh, I don't want to again sound overly optimistic. The short answer is yes. There's enough finance and there's enough impetus and possibly to sustain the market and continue on to keep, as it were, funding or investing into this market to make it grow and become a, a true, not even just have a few success stories from that financing, but become financially relevant in the way maybe even Switzerland is hmm. for the region in that sense to be a real, real hub in that influence, the way Hong Kong was or Singapore in, in that sense, if they keep continuing, right? Is it really great? Is it perfect? Is it compared to Silicon, you can watch Silicon Valley rules and regulations come here, they're, they're going to laugh because it's still so archaic in some regards. 
But as I mentioned before, it's iterated very well, and uh, we've created more, you know, angels in the last like four years than, than have, you know, in some amount of time combined. So it's iterated like I think uh, angel investment and VC loss changed like literally six times in the last four years. So and that scale it's great and it keeps going that way. We need a little bit more patient capital, and the Korean government is invested huge sums of money to support the venture capital community in doing so. And continuing that, so so in terms of the actual amount of money, in the raw amount, absolutely. In fact, I don't know if there is, or I would be happy to hear if there's another country spending more uh, to do so. For a 50 million people country, and spending 14 billion and 4 billion on this, I don't know another country that did so. Singapore did a little bit, Israel did a little bit to that regard that we benchmark and they benchmark us, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But our biggest problem is too much money being spent on this right now and it distorts the market a little bit. So when I said earlier that Silicon Valley or Europe guys don't know what the heck they're talking about when they come here, because you hear guys like in Europe or like the, the Europe fund putting $100 million towards the startups and like, I had some of the big accelerator guys to complain. Oh man, they're storing, they're locking up developers, doing this, taking free grant money and all that kind of stuff and we call, I call it grant entrepreneurship. You get these grant entrepreneurs, you know, they just get this free money from the government pushing out or VC money back from the government to do so and it kind of distorts their motivations and success rate mm. of the companies, right? But so they're doing all these tax incentives here and over there uh, and in Europe to try to make it happen. But I realized at one point, the scale at which they were talking about and complaining about it was ridiculous because it was out of proportion. We have so much more money flooded in and they're complaining they don't have enough money flooded in. Well, all right, well, boo-hoo, you don't have money and you know, you tell startups every day don't have money, just figure it out. The newest VC on the block is the government and you're, and you're whining about the fact that they're distorting the market because you don't have their money uh, as a VC over there. So uh, the answer is yes, a lot of money can support getting better uh, on the regulatory part and they are listening shockingly hmm. they are listening and they are changing every cycle that they can change you know kind of a, a it's not exactly a straight linear up but it's certainly a, um, a nice uh, a path that is heading in the right direction uh, who are the big players on there I don't want to like call out the guys necessarily but there are uh, at least 30, 30 big VCs happening uh, on that I have my alignment with, with a lot of them here the angel community here I think there are like 1800 registered angels uh, they're, they're like uh, just plenty of money on the angel side the angel side also can get matching so as an angel investor even a qualified angel puts in fifty to three hundred thousand dollars the government matches the same amount which is amazing in itself uh, we have new accelerators popping up and we have new global VCs or VC funds now setting up funds in Korea I can name one that in that regard. I'll name one because it's a uh, very interesting. Mm -hmm. Is 500 startups, which is one of the uh, largest or most uh, famous and prominent accelerators and VC funds out of Silicon Valley, just announced that they have set up a Korea-specific fund. I believe it's like 14 million dollar fund, which mm -hmm. is good for Korea, backed by the Korean government as well. And they already have some allocations that they already have set, and they're a huge player. That's a, a Silicon Valley company uh, accelerator, very famous one setting up a fund specific here and that's happening more and more talk a lot of VCs who ask the same question how do we make a fund out here or we we're now we're trying to build a fund for Asia and we're looking at Korea mm. as one of our prime areas so again there's a list and, it, and it's long and I don't, I don't mm. want to show any favoritism outside of the more interesting one that was Silicon Valley coming here but let's say every player that there is is putting out there if you can't find money for what you're doing whether it's an angel whether it's your, your friend family and fool to start up or the government grants or the VCs come out of it, then you should really maybe reevaluate what mm. business you're doing or whether you're the right person to be selling it. Can we maybe just explain the keywords? What is an angel investor? What is a venture capital fund? Absolutely. Uh, Sorry about that. So an angel investor is, is an individual who can make an investment into a company. Uh, we call them an angel because it takes it kind of an angelic, almost <laughs> like almost philanthropic kind of a, a desire to want to, and a little bit crazy to put your money uh, and bet it on a very know, early resource, stage, yeah. a very early stage company. Uh, you know, post napkin <laughs> idea uh, drawn on there and happened. The qualifications of how well you can uh, angel invest or invest your money uh, vary between person and experience as well. But generally, that tends to be from zero dollars up to maybe even half a million dollars. Um, if you talk outside of that, that zone, um, there are some angel groups, like people get together and create an angel investment group. 
but it's still on the angel side of it. They're not an institution. So that's where the, the other change would be. Venture capital itself would be institutional investment. So as opposed to an individual, like you know, Mr. Park's money going to, to you know, company X, it's actually the corporation of, of who control a fund investing. That's when it's more venture capital. And they tend to take up a little bit larger sizes, maybe from a couple, few hundred thousand to a few million. Uh, it's keep scaling up from there, of course, different size venture capitals. Uh, they'll handle investments anywhere from a few million to tens of millions. Uh, and that just scales along. They call it round, and you know, mm -hmm. it, whether it's a, a series. It goes usually from angel, friends, family, and fool, we say first. You know, you start off some bootstrapping your own money or your friend's money or your parents' money, uh, as it were. And then it goes maybe to angel investor, someone who's been in the business. Generally speaking, this is, and anyone can be an angel, but tend to be guys who have already been in business, uh, have a great amount of experience that they can add uh, value to the money so they know, they think they know where they can invest it into uh, another entity to do so. And then in the venture capital side, which is professional investors at an institution uh, who do it by course. So they have to allocate you know, millions of dollars towards, mm -hmm. towards uh, smaller or growth companies. In the slow growth situation in Korea, isn't that actually bonanza for startups in terms of financing? Because there's less capital demand from traditional firms, definitely less interesting yields. And so you have a lot of capital being shifted to this new economy because there's more or less nothing else out there. Yeah, you know, I hear that. I actually, I actually do hear that because I don't work in the P level, but I hear uh, from the industry, and I'm trying to funnel that as much as possible to uh, the advantage of startups, as it were, which is uh, to my advantage to the ecosystems and the sustainable advantage. It's my bet. But uh, a lot of um, guys who have normal money that they or allocating towards things like stress debt uh, or different kinds of credit lines, stuff like they're saying they even hear, hey, tech is a great place to be in. But it might as well be speaking another foreign language on mm -hmm. that side. So they are trying to dip in and do carve outs, both either their you know VC funds or allocations or pushing that direction. So uh, again, it works. I I'm happy to say yes, <laughs> in the sense that they're they're seeing this as a new asset class to to start jumping into, and how they carve that out is and it is up to their own mandates, as it were. But we're very exciting to see that it happening, that conversation starting. I think if it really starts kicking in, maybe over the next few years, because of the more success stories. You might be see some large macro shifts at the same time. You do have some big funds starting to put into random Korean companies. Hmm. The Elvin Major, Blackstone, all those guys are jumping in uh, with fund investments towards either Korean popular music companies, <laughs> entertainment side, or tech companies. Um, I, I believe Blackstone even did the Yellow Mobile recently too, which is interesting. So they're, they are definitely trying to push that way. You mentioned Korea needs more patient capital, but can capital afford to be patient? Korea had that issue a few years ago that there was no exit market. Mm -hmm. Once you had invested in a Korean uh, startup, it was extremely difficult to get out of that investment. Has that has the situation evolved and is the exit market more liquid now in Korea, so to speak? So it is actually one of the key points of, of understanding of how we make the success stories to continue it going on. So to the second point first, even at the the uh, conference, at the A22 conference we're making there, we're having for the first time in Korea what's called the M&A Summit. Mm -hmm. and, Merger and acquisitions. So, yeah. Merger and Acquisition Summit, specifically for trying to show, showcase, or stimulate uh, more liquid events, meaning selling the selling acquisition of companies or the uh, bringing it to the next stage, allowing for an IPO or a liquid event, uh, going public event. So reaching the size where we can say it where it creates uh, more you know wealth, success, uh, and pushes market forward. That doesn't exist previously for sure. Not doesn't exist. It was a very difficult market for it. But because of all the factors coming in line it's a perfect time for us to do something at the M&A Summit that wouldn't happen previously. Now what that means, we're taking giant enterprise companies worldwide, inviting them to Korea to look at growth companies in Korea that mo normally might not have come into the radar. That interestingly is partially backed and sponsored by the Korean government. Hmm. Korean Venture uh, Investment Association Corporation uh, is one of the sponsors for it. And 500 startups who I just mentioned is doing that fund there uh, are going to be our, our under a plus 82 platform specifically for that. If we actually have successes under that, then it's a huge win, uh, both PR-wise, both uh, success-wise in terms of the business, and for creating a more lasting effect. Now, back to the first question, patient capital, how can you afford to be patient? Now, again, that's the submission. We're running like heck to try to make the justification for patient capital because, a simple way to put it, so funds have cycles, lengths of time, uh, and we're in which where you have to spend fund money. In Silicon Valley, you're talking an average of like 10 to 12 years on, on a normal fund length. 
and that might not mean anything, but by comparison, Korea is seven years. Mm. You have a seven-year fund. That means you have to spend a lot of money in a short amount of time, and you have to create justification for that money being spent, i.e., a return in that short amount of time. It, it's taken 30 years, remember, for Silicon Valley to start getting in on, on the cycle that they're getting returns back. So now we've only started doing this and started lengthening. Some, you see some of the terms for the funds trying to get longer. And this means is we're trying to push to, look, small startup companies can reach billions and billions of dollars and affect the world. But those few cases you hear like an Instagram or, or these things that do it within two or three are very rare. Very rare and far in between even in, in the US and Silicon Valley or elsewhere. Facebook took what, nine years or 11 years mm. or whatever. That people don't notice that because they only see the last few years of it when it's, when it's already at critical mass. And so you think it's really quick. So Korea has unfortunate case, or most countries, that when you allocate government money to stimulate, you're under an administrative pressure politically to say, you spend a lot of billions of dollars, what do I get out of it? And the thing that they need to showboat around is saying we got an exit, an exit being an acquisition to a global firm, you're getting more global or you, you went to a public status in that time. So it's forcing something that naturally almost doesn't occur in business ever <laughs> and saying we're going to do it and it's going to work. So when I say patient capital, it's like, hey, you made an investment now and it's probably not going to mature till eight years, but almost all funds work that way. We just got to kick it through the first cycle of doing so. Now, there are some, some cases that are feeding back into it. So fortunately, to advantage, Korea being all the reasons I said is great, is it does cycle very, very fast. If we can cycle even more and more fast, those funds are going to see returns in a shorter amount of time than anywhere else. I'm not saying that means they're going to, everywhere is going to start making shorter funds or shorter timelines, but hopefully then the government sees enough traction on that where they can allow the, the, the money to sit longer to really allow the matures, and then you can see some amazing potential other uh, Samsung-sized companies and uh, NHN or, or other examples like that continue. One last question about finance. What is the role of the Chebos? Are they aggressively funding this new uh, ecosystem, or are they more threat because obviously they capture tons of technological and, 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 and well, human capital and financial. I hate having there. a lame answer. It's a great question because Chebos are the heart of Korea, a uh, lot okay. uh, of the economic growth. Uh, I hate to answer the lame question of yes and yes. It depends. But actually, I'm happy to say on the pure question of are they being aggressive, are they doing it? Absolutely. They're spending hundreds of millions of dollars on the startup ecosystem as well. Why they're doing it is a fun, controversial issue because <clears throat> basically the government, government forced them to do it, um, which is another effect of the government being very positive in action. If you're a startup and you're complaining about the government or, or conglomerates, these chebels as they're called here, are not giving you money, it's not out of lack of opportunity. Every major chebel conglomerate here has an innovation, a startup or related uh, program out that's giving out capital, money, funds, and resources for startups at this point. And again, some are self-motivated within internally, some are, are government pushed or incentivized, but whatever the reason, they're there. And in fact, Samsung, which is all, all it's easy to pick on them, being the, the biggest guy on the block, is they even started an innovation center in Silicon Valley and expanded to New York to, to compete right on the home turf of the <laughs> Silicon Valley guys. Good or bad, you tell me. They're doing it. It's there. It's resources. Are they doing more buyouts too? I believe the scale of that, the numbers are increasing as well. Let's maybe talk now about the government's involvement. I think you touched upon it already, but I'd like to ask you whether the Park Geun administration is good at its job because it's been communicating very well about its vision to in transforming Korea into this creative economy. Did you see anything change in your field of business? So the first question, is it doing its job well? I can yeah. only speak to my field of business. Hmm. Uh, and in the area of startups, ecosystem, creative economy, as in what that is really supposed to mean, very happy to say yes, it's been an amazing progress. And if you look at it on scale in the macro sense where we were four years ago to where we are now, it's a totally different country and environment. Like, like I said, when I started, the word startup wasn't even, didn't exist. Uh, I went from one accelerator, the one that we started, to the last application for an accelerator grant even for that was 60 accelerators. We had a major startup hubs and environments start, a lot of them backed by the government or stimulated or pushed by the government to do so, where you can have free co-working space, access to money and mentorships every single day, and they're major hubs all throughout the city. We have co-work spaces that popped up everywhere on this. We have literally entire blocks of, of buildings designated toward this environment because that's purely off of government spending towards it. The result of that, whether, again, and I keep going back, we have success stories enough to justify it is what we're, we're battling to make sure that we do get. But has there been progress? 
Well, what did not exist before exists now. So the stage is being built and being pushed by the government forcefully. They're creating more events, backing, uh, know-how, open-mindedness. When I say open-mindedness, within the government framework, so take that with a grain, <laughs> grain of salt. There's as much uh, tearing, out your, tearing out your hair uh, and wondering what the heck is going on here as much as there is uh, showing. But that's why you have to really keep a macro view on it. If you look at the progress, absolutely. Can it keep going? Uh, we hope so. The government announced uh, a stimulus package last year, mm -hmm. promised to invest $3.7 billion equivalent uh, in startups. It sounds great on paper, but isn't there a bubble slowly building up, uh, especially since that money is supposed to be spent uh, over the course of three years only? Yeah, actually, um, and the number overall for ICT in this area is, is much bigger. It's mm -hmm. around $13 billion, which is insane. And insane only as far as do you know how to spend it. Now, is it a bubble? It's only a bubble if we don't succeed, right? Mm. <laughs> so, um, so we need to wait seven years until we know whether it was a bubble or not? Or? Yeah, kind of, yeah. So they pick $3.9 billion for many reasons, which I don't won't know, you know a, a drop of, except for the idea it needs to be spent and needs to go in this area, and they want to give as much room as possible to do so. Other countries are using just law or tax incentives to do so. We're throwing money to put behind it. Is it a bubble? Again, what number isn't a bubble then? So. The implication is if you only spent $50 million, it would have been reasonable. But then I guarantee you have just as many, literally if not more, saying we didn't get enough money to do this properly, mm. that's why it failed. Now you're having people, oh, you created a bubble, that's why it failed. No, no, no. The only failure at this point, there are no excuses for the Korean economy, for me, for the government's going on is you only failed because you, you didn't make it happen. <laughs> you know, that wasn't, that wasn't, wasn't done right. You know, you mm. spent this one wisely, you spent that one poorly, and, and it didn't go the right way. So there's always a little bit of luck and hope on it, but fortunately, we have all the things aligned in the right direction. Uh, global trend, idea, open-mindedness to do so. We talked about uh, government policies and government uh, incentives. I want to ask you a few political questions now. First, are wiretapping accusations undermining the potential of Korean tech startups at home and abroad. And of course, I'm talking about the fact that two million people switched from Kakao Talk to an unknown app called Telegraph, allegedly because it's well encrypted because they do not want the government tapping into their Kakao Talk conversations. No. No. No, not at all. The fact that I, I barely even knew about the issue and I like, deal with this every day, mm. I give you an indication. It's like uh, the same, same uh, question that you get if you live in Seoul, as uh, we're here in Seoul. Almost every single friend I have that does not live in Seoul, when a big issue about North Korea comes up, they go, oh my god, aren't you scared? In time, do you see the startup ecosystem maturing enough to constitute a political force akin to the Chebols or other stakeholders in Korea, or do you think it's still going to stay very fragmented? That's what we're working on, actually. It's good. For one example, um, we started what's called the Accelerator Leaders Forum, which is a pseudo-government, it's government-backed early organization it's, um, of the top accelerators in Korea being aligned and having a voice. And the idea of that voice is to not have the government say directly how accelerators should work, but with them trusting a group of them to say this is how it should work. And then as that grows up, it should become an official entity where it becomes the voice of how to allocate certain monies to how accelerators should be done. So it's them betting at the early stage, it has to go through again its processes, which is frustrating. But as long as you know where the path is going in the right direction, it's positive. And there are many groups like this being formed, both on the Chebel side and the government side, and not, not just the accelerator side. So eventually the idea is that we're hopeful that those will become strong voices uh, and influential ones. Mm -hmm. and so far, so good. The, the right moves are being made. Uh, Richard, two last questions about the future. Do you see Seoul rising in the ranks and becoming a world-class startup stronghold? What is required, to, or what is still required to make that a reality? And related to that, is there anything that has been failed and where you feel that it may threaten this rise of the Seoul startup scene? Um, stronghold meaning like have the a place to go, the place to be if you want to be an entrepreneur worldwide or at least in the region. Well, I already think it started to, to be that, certainly in the region, uh, Asia region. Uh, it's one of the hot spots that if you're in doing a startup, you'd be in neglect to actually look at uh, Korea or you weren't doing your homework very well on that if you're really open minded to any of the markets for it. Mm -hmm. To continue on, as I mentioned before, um, uh, we have to find the success stories before the administration runs out, the creative economy. On the We have to be aware of the political forces at work and align with them and allow them to satisfy their KPIs, as I say, their, their key performance indexes that allow them to tell the rest of the people of Korea that this is why we did it. So that answers the second question, what is the biggest dangers? Things like unions or like Uber is a good example, or the pushback and saying, why are you spending the money to do this and we're not patient, show me, some, show me a result. Like how did it literally 
pave my road. If these practical, very practical answers cannot be answered in this time of the administration, then we're going to have a tough time actually continuing into the next one. And that is a challenge both for the economy, the people, for the initiative, and for the money being spent uh, to do so. And there are a lot of factors that work to make that happen, but, you know, it's, it's a race to that, to that end. Yeah, Richard, uh, thank you so much for being our guest today. No problem. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Thanks. This was Korea and the World. To make sure you don't miss our next episode, bookmark our website, koreaandtheworld.org, subscribe to our podcast on iTunes, and follow us on Facebook and Twitter.